Boyd's work. This is um, episode four of our exploration of, of John Boyd's work and episode two of N, specifically exploring Boyd's paper, sorry, Chuck Spinney's paper about Boyd's work, evolutionary epistemology. It's two of N because this is probably one of the most important pieces of work in, in the kind of Boyd canon. And we've got no idea how long it's going to take or how many episodes we're going to need to get to the bottom of this. So, um, so yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's, um, yes, last week's episode was, uh, was, was interesting. We didn't actually get very far. So I think we're just going to do a quick intro and uh, pick up where we left off. There probably will be a little shout out to current affairs, obviously with at the end of, at the end of February right now, there's, um, an active land-based war going on in Europe and, and UDA is a, um, a theory that was born from warfare and strategy. So there probably will be some mention of current affairs, but we're, we're going to try and stick clear of that because we want to stick to the, stick to the material itself. So, uh, Mark, welcome back. What greetings from today? greetings from the Eastern United States. Hope everything is well across the sea in the UK. And as you say, they, these are, uh, interesting times. And the more we uh, discuss these concepts and the more people understand them and start to explore them on their own, um, I would bet that it would help their understanding of things and help them be able to uh, filter out things effectively to be aware of how their observations are shaped and how their decisions and their actions uh, and their learning are shaped. So, Yeah, it's certainly been, uh, been an interesting few days. So um, should we just pull up the slides and just and just carry straight on from from where we were yeah because this is a critical so in our continued conversation as you say to event i mean this is this is the critical point of understanding boyd theory in so many respects but the ability to combine analysis and synthesis and to not merely analyze things to be able to uh, assemble things and to create a new reality by synthesis uh, this is one of the most critical points, I would say, in all of Boyd, other than the fact that orientation is really the supreme point. Um, analysis, so, I'm sorry, analysis and synthesis would probably be one of the massively supreme, or is, as he drew it out. Well, in it's, group. it's kind of the process of, of orientation, right? The, this whole kind of recursive analysis, analysis and synthesis ongoing process is the mechanism by which orientation is is constructed so so we spent quite a lot of time on this slide last episode um so the last episode if anyone's interested can be found on my um my youtube page at the moment um we will be having a proper sort of podcast um website for this eventually but at the moment it's um uh, the the channel on youtube is called commando development uh, we'll be moving all of these into their own sort of channel website at some point but we probably spent i don't know 20 20 25 minutes on just this slide last time didn't we so we did we do a quick a quick recap and then and then we'll move on so the easiest way that i remember analysis and synthesis i think on one hand analysis i break things down to their components and then with synthesis we'll talk about boyd's very famous example i'm trying to take what i've analyzed uh, separate it from its previously known domain and create something novel, create a new reality that didn't previously exist, whatever I uh, broke it down with. I've got to look at the my copy of the Boyd book. Uh, the Quorum book is upstairs, but he quotes Boyd Boyd's description of an, ana an analyst and somebody that was, you know, they can tell you everything about nothing. There's some kind of quote, like, you know, they can tell you everything you ever wanted to know about something, which ultimately means nothing, or uh, we'll have to get the exact quote, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good. And I, I've worked with a lot of people who are phenomenal analysts. And if it doesn't fit their picture of the way they were trained as analysts and what they're looking at, I think that uh, they're very blind to other possibilities. And that's where, Again, the power of really understanding Boyd and Uda is being able to pull yourself out of your own comfort zone, your own domain, and to look at things from multiple perspectives so that you could piece together what you analyzed 
in a completely new reality that didn't currently exist. That's the real power of uh, what we'll talk, what we'll talk about. And we and we'll, when we refer, I think to Boyd's most famous example that he's known for, um, I think that people will get it. Yeah. So that's it. That's interesting. Actually, we didn't cover this last time, but I just wanted to touch on it before we move on to the next slide. So, so if you're, if you're more inclined to be an analyst, right, more inclined to analyze and perhaps overanalyze, I think what we're saying is that you're, you're at risk of falling into a kind of false path dependency on the past, right? Whereas mm. synthesis is a way of almost kind of drawing a line under what you've seen, moving into a different phase and saying, okay, that was then, but we need to, you know, we, we need to re-examine the world as it actually is. Because if right. otherwise, you know, if your your analysis, the process by which you do your analysis also has to be continually evolving. So there's this kind of co-recursive process here that you're, you, you know, synthesizing changes the way you analyze and analyze changes and analysis changes the raw materials you have with which to syn you, you have to synthesize, synthesize from. Mm -hmm. And it's always a moving, uh, a moving feast, right? Should we, um, I would, I would ask, I would ask Mike, one of the questions I would love to ask Chuck Spinney is because I've used this before and I would want to know what he thought of this, but I think that analysts are really great at telling you about content, right? If you can synthesize, I think you're probably not, you, you're good at content, but you're also probably better at context and you can see things from a higher view from a bigger picture and you're able to piece things together maybe with a more of a multidisciplinary background. And, you know, when you think of Boyd's canon, I mean, it's so multidisciplinary, it's ridiculous. And, and that's why I think, again, this is such a fundamental part when you're talking about John Boyd, because your, your advantage when you synthesize is that you pulled from so many perspectives or that you were able to see so many perspectives that you were able to observe or anticipate something that didn't, currently exist so that's again that's the that's the raw power of this if you look at the very next slide i mean one of my favorite words with this is creativity and you know creation it's one thing to destroy things but then how do you build it back up into something new yeah you, know, you have to you have to create in order to destroy you have to destroy in order to create that's the whole uh, concept of destruction creation and then you know one of the things that uh, Joseph Schumpeter the famous uh, economist from Austria who was not necessarily not necessarily in today's terms aligned with the Austrian school per se although there are some there are some synergies um, but his term creative destruction was that when you know the iPhone destroys the need for a home movie camera, the need for film, the need for a record collection, a physical record collection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like the, the creativity, the creation of the iPhone made all that stuff obsolete. And then again, when we're, when we're synthesizing effectively, we were anticipating change or we're creating change and we're creating a new reality that allows us to have that uh, uh, capacity for independent action on our own terms. Mm. Mm, yeah, there was something that I hadn't noticed before on the previous slide. Actually, it's one of the words that it used for um, for the synthesis is construction. Yeah. So if you're not analyzing, in so in one sense, like analyzing is breaking down into smaller and smaller building blocks, and then using those to construct. If you're trying to construct your reality from, you know, inappropriately large chunks, you you never kind of have that like close fidelity with the environment. So it's a, it's a question of how well your model can fit and the way to fit it is to, you know, it's almost like fitting a curve, right? Fitting a curve mm -hmm. under a graph is like the, the closer together you have the stripes. Well, those, those three words that he has for each term, you know, deduction for, in, for analysis, deduction, differentiation, destruction. And then on the other hand, you have synthesis, induction, integration, construction. I mean, it really is, I just to simplify it again, I think you hit it, break down, build up, yeah. but not necessarily build back the way it was. That's the, I think that's, yeah. the, that's the critical Boyd part. Just cause you knock something down. Doesn't mean you create a, uh, this is one thing from the Boyd book where they talk about, you know, they're putting a fresh coat of paint on the old strategies, you know, yeah. and, and, and build it as new. You can't do that. 
that's not how it works you have to yeah so that, that's actually very interesting because you know in, in in the current world there's so much talk about you know let's get back to normal let's get you know let's get back on track and things like that and and in reality when you do break things down enough you know you're the the, the reality of, of life is it's exponential what the, the the other options are so the chances of you going back you know in evolutionary terms as well mm -hmm. the, the likelihood of you actually going back to something similar to where you are is actually vanishingly small you always move forward you don't ever you know the line of causality goes one way yeah much as we might want to be able to um you know unroll mistakes that were made or or have another go you always have another go in a what was it the um the quote no man steps in the same river twice because he's no longer right, the same man and it's no longer the same river well and then you think too do you want to go back to a time with no running water no electricity no i mean it's always a salad bar you know i just want to take the parts that i like you know i i, I want to i'll skip that i'll say you know, well of course we want electricity that goes without saying or of course we wanted this you know it goes without saying so i think when people i think you're right you know to go back to the way it was that's a that's a figment of somebody's imagination you know I, yeah. somebody talks about like well it was the golden age of hollywood you know or the golden age uh they say you know hip-hop you know like the golden age of hip-hop was i guess like the mid 80s to like 2000 or something like that like if you were in the golden age would you have known it mm. would you have known that that was the golden age like when you know i was 1990 and i remember going to national record mart uh, in Pittsburgh, where I grew up with my best friend and we we're getting uh, public enemies, new album, fear of a black planet. And, you know, right in the middle of the golden age of hip hop, <laughs> but I'm telling you, nobody was calling it the golden age of hip hop. Cause we didn't know. Yeah. You know, so yeah. right here, people like my grandparents would say, Oh, how great it was in the fifties. You know, but it was like a golden age. Did, did you know it then? No, of course not. I mean, it's just, that's that's our models right that's our <laughs> that's our uh, the, gold, the golden age is always behind you i guess it's always behind said. you yeah yeah okay anyway. <laughs> all right so shall we move on to okay so well i think we've kind of covered this haven't we so this is interesting yeah, a single domain your, your yeah context is, well we, i said content and context but i mean you, your your context is not complete because it's only uh, it, it's in the realm of one domain, you know, an investment company, they might have a healthcare analyst and an automotives analyst and a industrials analyst and whatever. And they're really good at that, but you need, you need a over like a portfolio manager to be able to fuse all that together. Yeah. You know, there's a really great cellist and they're the best cellist ever, but you need a conductor that knows a lot about everything to kind of fuse it all together to turn it into a symphony, right? Yeah, that might be the that might be an interesting way to think about analysis, the difference between analysis and synthesis. Yeah, I think I find that the notion of focus here quite interesting as well, because the, the, there's a kind of subtext of, of this slide is that, you know, focus on something means that you, you're moving towards something, right? You, you mm -hmm. have a, a goal in mind. So it's analysis is maybe not quite as exploratory as I some sometimes would have or as I would naturally have expected it and you know when you consider there's a focus you're obviously you're shutting things out and you're you know you're you're focusing on a single goal which means that you're necessarily removing a lot from consideration because there's you know there's a hot energy gradient you have to go up to to process things so if you're constraining that to focus on a particular outcome there's a mm. there's a dynamic there that's quite interesting would you would you consider uh, having a, a broader focus of effort versus a narrower focus of effort because if a, a, like a narrow focus would allow me to narrowly focus on something and i wind up missing the forest through the trees or I, I i wind up missing the the big picture whereas if i have a generalist approach or like again a, a, from a better synthesizer my focus of effort is broader and all encompassing yeah so i think i think that's true that's true but there's you know in a perfect world you know assuming that physics and reality weren't a thing you you would take all the information you possibly could in order to mm -hmm. synthesize it right mm -hmm. but 
you know, information theory tells us that there is, you know, there's time and energy involved in, in doing this analysis. Mm -hmm. And therefore you have to, I mean, that's what the implicit guidance and control of from observation is for, right? You have to remove some parts of, you know, ground reality in order to be able to do this at all. And then, you know, that throws up a whole other kind of second, third order effect of, you know, what is it that you ignore? Mm -hmm. What is it that you focus on? Is that being shaped? Is that being shaped by somebody who doesn't have your best interests at heart or are you shaping it? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think we're in danger of wandering into uh, current affairs territory here, but <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the, that, that focus of focus of effort, that kind of, um, you know, center of gravity is, as the military strategists would call it. If you pick the wrong one, or if you are, are operating on, you know, you're, you're doing your analysis with wrong assumptions, mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of along that path of going down that kind of cognitive spiral that Boyd talks about. Well, and, and then, well, I guess I wouldn't say in this case, I would just say, I wouldn't say narrow because then, you know, we're gathering a variety of observations about a single domain, break them down and correlate those from a variety of, of perspectives and that might be the missing link for a lot of uh individuals is that they're not getting a variety of perspectives they're they're yep they're getting one perspective not uh not multiple perspectives yeah. and and you know in today's world one increasingly polarized perspective as well so it's not even like you're sat in the center of multiple different perspectives and getting something that's broadly you know, representative of all, if that's, if such a thing is possible, but you're actually probably attached to a narrative that is moving towards some extreme or another, which means that, you know, the, the further towards the extremes you go, the harder it is to get the variety. So one of the early in my career, I worked at a firm where one of the characteristics of one of the better managers was to basically what he was doing was red teaming or playing devil's mm -hmm. advocate. And he would have uh, all of his analysts from their respective categories. They would have to be, uh, they would have to defend their thesis in front of all the other analysts and mm -hmm. they would get questioned and, and, and deposed. And um, I remember one time, you know, they had a major American automotive company uh, that the automotive analysts said, no, and he had to defend why it was a no. And it was, I think it was the, the combination of the financial analyst and the healthcare analyst that had uncovered other opportunities within that from their perspective that actually added to the conversation such that he sent all three of them out to this company to, to reinforce the thesis. But if they had only gone on the one guy's analysis from that community, you know, from that, yeah. Uh, that they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have gained the other perspective. And I think that that's, you know, when he says the variety of perspectives, and then when we get to the next slide, this is, this is one of my favorite uh, tests to do is when I, when I present this, I'll show this uh, picture by picture. So I'll show the square and then the triangle and, and then, you know, the, 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 the top, you know, well, you and I know it's a pyramid, but when I'm showing this to people, they, they don't necessarily. Yeah. And, what I try to tell people is you can, you can go, they'll, they'll literally to the death. They'll tell you that's a square. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen them before. Uh, I went to school to learn everything I need to know about squares. I know that that's a square, or I know that that's an isosceles triangle, or I know that that's a triangle with a line down the middle or it's however they want to describe it. Yeah. What I think we're trying to encourage and facilitate is by using, uh, uh, you know, effective Boyd theory or effective Boyd analysis, you know, in synthesis, where I'm going to say it's a square, but I'm going to be open. I'm going to hold that opinion loosely because knowing that things are uncertain, knowing that thing, I can never have complete information, I could be looking at the bottom of a pyramid or yep. I could be looking at the side of a pyramid or I could be looking at the corner of a pyramid. I, I might not be, but I'm going to I'm going to leave that open as a contingency just in just yep. in case. that might be. Or, a better or you could be peering at something that you've never experienced before and you're your sense, your sensory filtering is telling you that it's something that you already know of. That's also based not. off your biases or your own experience, yeah. your own education, right? 
And that's what, again, we're talking about being able to break the models down. Um, there's a quorum talks about, you know, it's not outside the box thinking it's destroy the box. We're going to get to that, but mm. you have to destroy the boxes because the box means that you were still defining it in terms of something that it was not in terms of what it could what it could be now i will say this the only one that's ever gotten that test i've done the first time was my dyslexic son yeah the first one i showed him was the square with an x yep and he said dad that's a square it's either a square with an x or the top of a pyramid wow <laughs> oh he was he was 12 maybe 11 or 12. um he's 16 these days but um yeah it was hilarious i mean he just bam nailed it um, because I will tell you one of the massive gifts that he has, he's able to see things from, uh, incredible perspectives that nobody, uh, nobody thinks of. So, yeah. um, it is interesting. Yeah, that, that is, that is interesting. So the, there's just one, one last thing at the bottom, um, constrained integration always takes us back to the same pyramid. Mm. So, so that's. You know, considering what we just talked about a few minutes ago, that's the box. Yeah, you're still in the box. Still in right? the if box. You, if you're getting the same thing in in the real world, you never get the same thing because time is a, you know time moves on, mm -hmm. and um, you know reality changes. So you're never going to get back to the same pyramid. But for the purposes of this, where you have a fixed, you know, a fixed and unmoving set of inputs. So it's a, this is a useful sort of thought exercise, but it doesn't match, you know, our day-to-day -day cognitive reality that we actually have to operate in. It's not a new reality where it could be advantageous though, is that if, if I'm preparing only for square, I'm going to get, I'm not going to be as well off as the team or the individual that prepared for square, but allowed that it could be a pyramid. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I, I anticipated that it could be something else. So I had the flexibility or the agility to, to be able to do that. Yeah. On, on the other hand though, if you prepared for square and you're in a world of all squares and your adversaries and the world isn't changing and your adversaries are spending some of their energy preparing for not square, actually until the world changes, you would, you would be at an advantage because you'd be completely optimized. You know, this is the whole, whole kind of, you know, factories that are optimized to within an inch of their life and then anything changes in the whole global supply chain, they will fall over. Mm. But actually, while they are, while the system is relatively um, stable, it makes sense to do that. So maybe they could both be wrong. Sorry, like, let's say let's say we're, you know, one side is preparing for square, the other side is preparing for triangle, but they both missed a pyramid. Yeah. You know, we use, I guess we the, the point about. the point is that if if you're in a if you're in a very stable world, mm. and I you know you see this all the time in companies, right? If you whether you know it or not, but you you're operating like the world is stable and not moving, right? And you're operating in a hyper hyper efficient manner based on your analysis of the world that's not moving. The 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 people that are doing horizon scanning during that period of of stagnation will be falling behind mm. because then they're, they're, they're expending some of their energy looking for the, looking for the, the differences. And they will probably, probably be fighting constant pressure to drive more efficiencies. Right. And to, to the outside world, the company that is optimized for how things are is moving ahead. You know, their financials are better and everything else. It's not until the world changes that, all of a sudden now they've completely atrophied their ability to adapt and respond mm. and then it's the point so it's it's a kind of um you know survivability thing right you're you're hyper efficient when things aren't changing but you're completely fragile when things do change i would bet that kodak was really good at making film like they were i would the bet so in the world. Uh, or i would bet that polaroid was the best at polaroiding whatever we would call yep. that and blockbuster was probably really good at the logistics of sending out packages and getting them back and charging for when they were late mm -hmm. 
yeah okay cool so, let's, so that, uh, that does that, that's a great point though is that you can be you can perceive yourself as the best square identifier the best triangle identifier or whatever but if you're you, as he says you're constrained to bring it back to that same pyramid but it's something it's it's going to be a cylinder you know or it's going to be a sphere or something um i i i, I get that and you could you could think of a lot of yeah, it'd be really easy to analyze when you're at Kodak and say, we're the best at what we do. We don't have to worry about anything. You know? Yeah. Indeed. So, right. So. So this is the this is the famous experiment. This yeah. is the flip side. This is looking outside of the square. This is looking so outside of the one. pyramid. Yeah. I I love this one. I, I do this a lot. Um, I've before COVID, I would do it in a live session on a whiteboard and I would draw four quadrants and I would, I would ask people to tell me as many, let's analyze each domain, you know, skier, speedboat, uh, toy tank, or sometimes depending on where I'd be, I'd say bulldozer. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, you end up getting, uh, it really works well on a whiteboard because you end up getting the domains classified and then we all agree. And then I erase all the you would erase all the domains. You'd erase speedboat. You'd you, you'd erase the ovals in this case. Yeah. Um, but I think the the point of of in destruction creation, what Spinny's telling us here, is that we will classify these things in terms of the box. Right. We're going to classify those things. We're going to constantly look at those things in terms of the box that they were put in until we don't. Until we force ourselves to shatter that model of skier or toy tank or bicycle. And then we're, we're left with, uh, you know, 24 seemingly non-correlated components that we have to come up with a new, a new reality. Mm -hmm. now, I know, I, I know um, I've had a lot of fun with this one because this is where most people, if they can get this, you're, I would give them a check on their report card. Okay, you have a very good basic understanding of UDA and how it, how it really works. Yep. But if they can't get this, you know, it's going to be difficult. So yeah. we, 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 we put these things, we classify them in domains. We start to analyze, right? We're analyzing each domain and we break down the component parts of what we can observe in terms of that domain and then as we progress we continue to see that each one of those components correlates together to create that domain but the bottom line is the is the, the the bottom yellow box is the is the thing that a lot of people can't do shatter the correspondence between the parts and the domains just take that completely out take out toy tank take out speedboat that's the next slide um take out all of the in other words this is the thing outside of the box i got rid of the box and i'm just left with my thoughts or as boyd said he called it a sea of anarchy mm. components a wash and a, a float or a wash in a, a sea of anarchy because tank treads don't normally have anything to do with wheels or a seat yeah skis, whatever so this is this is interesting because really what what you've done here is you've taken you've taken four systems that were separate and you've taken away the boundaries mm -hmm. and that's the the kind of interesting thing here is that each of those domains you know we do this in software all the time like we model a domain it's even called a bounded domain and within that domain there is internal structure and logic that is not it's hidden behind an interface layer right so mm -hmm. what you're doing when you're taking this away you know, it's kind of like a, you know, if you were if you were to take a motorcycle apart, actually take a motorcycle apart, you can do that. You mm -hmm. can take it all apart, strip it down to its complete individual components, and then you can put it back together again. And if you're a good enough mechanic, you'll get the thing back that you started with. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't do that with a squirrel, mm -hmm. because when once you remove the boundary of a living system. The boundary is the thing that defines it as a living system as a as a mm -hmm. as a viable entity so so that's potentially one reason why people find this so difficult is because you know we inherently are are driven by 
defining the, you know, the outside of a system and the inside of a system. To take away the boundary is an artificial thing to do. It's a leap of sort of cognitive, cognitive leap that you don't often do. Mm. I think what he, and I think as we, as we progress through these slides, you see that he's saying we shatter these, we, sh we shatter the delineation, but we're still probably thinking, and even though we've shattered the correspondence, we're still thinking of these things in terms of what they were, yeah, not what they could be. Yeah. So, so we, even though we take away the boundary, Mm -hmm. well, on the on the previous side, it was it was actually explicitly there, wasn't it? Even though we take away the boundary, we've still got the relationships there. Mm -hmm. So when we when we remove this even further, we've still got we've still got the relationships there. We've we've we're still thinking of you know larger concepts, and we're thinking of the individual components as they fit into larger concepts. Yeah, got it. Yep. Okay. We're still we're still biasing our observations based off something of what something was or what i learned that a chain was for or skis were for or handlebars were for or chalets were for whatever yep. you know we're still allowing our orientations to shape our observations by classifying from the you know the previously existing domain yeah but because of course that you know that's the way cognition works like our, yeah. our, our cognition is set up so that we can see the things that we're familiar with and mm -hmm. very very quickly in the intuitively jump to how we can use those affordances in a way to you know build our capacity for independent action as we move through the world so we are you know driven almost or, or you know genetically required to make these links so mm. going the other way is actually, you know, you're going against nature in some ways. It's hard to take the antithesis from the thesis, right? It's, mm -hmm. hard, it's hard to take the opposite view and work your way back. Okay. So, so yeah, that's, yeah that's, so that's what we just said. Yeah. What we just said, he just, it, we're still looking at those things in terms of their legacy, right? We're still allowing our previous experience of how we understand those pieces or what we've learned or what we're still allowing that to shape how we're thinking about those things. Yeah. And each each step that we've been we've been going through requires more and more you know energy and time to go through, right? So there's another reason why you don't often do this because when you're in the familiar domain when you when you are using the thing as it was designed or experienced before, mm -hmm. that's the low energy way to do things. So breaking the domains down takes more energy shattering the correspondence among those paths and the legacy of their domains takes again, more energy. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. And it's, and it's uncomfortable. It could be uncomfortable yeah. because I don't want to think of something. I don't want to think of something uh, in terms of, I have to do something new or we have to build something or we have to buy this or whatever. Like I, yeah. I don't want to upset my apple cart. And, and what he's teaching us is that, yeah, you have to not only upset the apple cart, you have to radically do it and completely shatter how you understand things. Because if you don't, your, your understanding and the meaning that you apply to something could be completely divergent from reality. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got just completely bare components you know it's, it's and, and this, I, I guess yeah so this this kind of speaks to like the granularity i was talking about earlier right if if and just a little aside about how we design socio-technical systems in in tech companies yep. you always have a choice between buy and build so you know are you going to spend programmer time building a content management system or building a um contacts database or whatever right and the, you know the old days you would get a um you know you you well in fact not even in the old days right you've always still got the choice right you, if you need something to do x there's always somebody selling something off the shelf to do x or close to x mm -hmm. and you know probably 10 15 years ago the amount of energy expenditure in terms of capital to be able to build something 
as maybe an order of magnitude more than it would be to build something now because these components exist at smaller and smaller um, uh, granularities and it's easier and easier to put them together to compose them together into larger chunks of functionality mm -hmm. so what would have been a good choice maybe 10 years ago to buy something off the shelf has evolved so that in today's world you know it it's an equally good choice say to to build it out of smaller components supplied by somebody else outsource yeah so i mean as an example um if you wanted to do something that you know something to do with workflow management and i built i built systems like this before you know 10 years ago you would be designing the software framework you would be you know setting up some kind of um pub sub queue and you might buy the pub sub queue but you'd have to run that infrastructure yourself mm -hmm. and nowadays if you wanted to, if you wanted to model something that's a workflow system there's any number of things that you can just buy off the shelf and you can still build your system but you build much less of the the foundations of it because people have mm -hmm. done this over and over and over again and you've got a sort of more raw material in the form that you want anyway mm -hmm. going off topic a little bit so well no you're thinking like an economist right i mean you're 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 looking to outsource something that you don't have a comparative advantage in meaning that it's going to cost me more to make something that's going to distract attention or capital away from from something that we could meaningfully do when i could get it at a much lower cost a much lower capital cost by by outsourcing it you know do i want to uh, uh build our own crm or do i want to buy one off the shelf that already exists it's already been proven i don't have to reinvent the wheel because the the consumption of capital in terms of my time um i'm yeah. gonna have to i'm, I'm gonna wind up losing a lot you know and i don't have an edge doing that it's easier to uh, or not easier but it would be simpler for me to outsource that probably i'll be able to act faster too because i'm not going to have to yeah. divert resources away but. okay so moving on so we're looking at these pieces and i did read i think it's in the quorum book too about how boy would help people along with this analogy if they weren't getting it but a lot of people will look at these and they'll I say, now start to connect pieces in here for something that didn't previously exist. So don't look at things in terms of a boat. Don't look at terms of things of a toy tank. You know, try to figure out something else that didn't previously exist. And in this case, you see there's an underlining of tank treads, outboard motors, and there it is, the, the contiguous the constituents uh, swimming in the sea of anarchy, right? Mm. We're, we're trying to apply meaning with, you know, our understanding of the world. We're trying to dis disassociate our understanding of these pieces in terms of their previous domains. So we're trying to shatter them and create something new that didn't exist. And as we keep going, we if you go to the next slide, we see even more things emerge. You know, we start to look at those things and we zero on those things. And then the next page is surprise. Most people at this point would say snowmobile. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is John Boyd uh, yeah. said, that, you know, there's between a winner and a loser. A winner was someone that could make, make snowmobiles by synthesizing a new reality from what you previously analyzed that you were able to effectively shatter their pre-existing domains as you understood them and you were able to create something completely new that didn't previously exist yeah and the you know the key intuition here is that without breaking the things down like you can't make a snowmobile with with treads that are on a tank right they have mm -hmm. to be off the tank same with handlebars same with everything else right so mm -hmm. You have to look at things from, from, uh, you know, divorced from the way that you would attach them to other things beforehand. 
Okay. Well, and then the cool. next slide, the next slide says that just because you think, just because you create a snowmobile, doesn't mean it's great. Like you can come up <laughs> with the same, you could come up with the same, uh, you know, you could use the same parts or similar parts and come up with something, but it might not be. As if, I mean, think of all the think of all the things at the time seemed awesome, but they were very quickly determined to be obsolete by an agile competitor yeah. you know well i mean this is this is the thing right but well, now we're into firmly into this into the um into evolution here yeah. right so the evolution by natural selection is doing this all the time because whatever can be combined will be combined over time and um so you know the the equivalent of of those two machines on the right there mm -hmm. are you know physical body plans that never panned out or evolutionary dead ends that suddenly the, the landscape changed and, and that organism or species was no longer viable mm -hmm. or a business model that stopped working or a you know business model that was before its time and didn't didn't work out yeah blackberry was really cool until an iphone came out you know or a palm pilot was really cool until the iphone came you know that so some synthesis doesn't mean just because you synthesize something that you think is awesome doesn't mean that it necessarily <laughs> that's true and when and when these things die as as um as blackberry did it releases new new things into the wild so i mean i don't know i don't know what ever happened to um to blackberry's recruiting portal mm. but you know there's certainly a uh Boydian use for a website called rim jobs in the world <laughs> that might have gone on to be used for something else <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry uh, to throw that one in there you, there you mentioned like the first <laughs> yeah 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 um i wasn't thinking that though but i got i got you <laughs> uh, <laughs> um yeah, it's funny i had a thought that i i can't think of uh <laughs> oh no I was, okay yeah i i know i was gonna say when was the last time you checked your myspace account yeah right i mean that was pretty awesome when was the last time you searched on Lycos yeah or Jeeves ask Jeeves I mean those are all quote-unquote snowmobiles but they weren't yeah I actually walked past in in West London there's a block but well there was uh, a few years back there was a blockbuster store just right. you know a shell of a store and never been something else but it still had the blockbuster sign and and everything else and uh, I was like whoa you know really incongruous because well that's a yeah when you say blockbuster because you know we're talking about in, in, in constraints of the pyramid blockbuster was trying to make a better blockbuster mm -hmm. netflix was trying to get movies to the, the viewer faster more effectively they weren't worried about creating a new pyramid you know they were they were off on a completely different synthesis you know a different a different reality but when you look at the components though same thing people in their homes watching watching movies um but they literally shattered our 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 understanding of home entertainment in a blockbuster world we used to have uh, family video here we used to have uh what was that other one hollywood video and there were some others here in the states but like that was your you picked blockbuster because they were the better pyramid right or they were the yeah. better <laughs> but netflix completely synthesized something something new and then when you when you understand home entertainment now you don't do it in terms of blockbuster you don't think that way you don't think in correspondence to that because it's been it's, you you yourself have finally caught up to that so you yourself have finally shattered that correspondence you know there's a lot of late adopters i'm sure that love to go to blockbuster um as i understand it there's only one left and it's not even a real one it's you know it's just they own the name or they bought the name rights or something i think it's in oregon yeah but, uh, anyway so well so um it never hurts to remind ourselves that most concept descriptions or new startups do not work so well in the real world and we could think of we could stand in front of a board and write down examples of great new things that didn't pan out i mean we've just yep. mentioned a few um and we can go on and on with that yeah so, and there's probably a lot of those that would have panned out had this process been working in the background right so there's probably a lot of these things mm -hmm. that you know, like what do you think? All the time in, in tech startups, 
Do you have an example? Um, I'll I'll let it I'll I'll mull over it for a bit while I keep talking. But it's um, a tough one. That's a tough one on the spot. Yeah. Although yesterday we did uh, we were we were driving to a, uh, another part of the state and we stopped for coffee and there was a record store next to it. So sometimes these things make a you know quote unquote comeback. I think it's a very niche. Yep. market of people who are buying uh, records because I can literally fit the entire canon of any of my favorite artists, you know, all on, uh, all on this. Why would I, why would I buy physical, physical yeah. things? With so actually I, I can think of an example now. Okay. So, so the, the world is littered with, you know, startup ideas that, you know, got a bit of early traction and they, you know, go and raise a seed round or go and raise a series A or something. And that money just sort of evaporates into nothing as people get lost in their own complexity. Mm -hmm. But there is an example of a startup that, that, um, that didn't do that, that started off as a, I think it was a game. I think it was a games company. Mm -hmm. And within this games, within this game, they needed to be able to send messages to each other. Like to the different mm. players need to be able to send messages to each other. And um, by doing this process of of snowmobiling, they realized that actually the message, the messaging thing was the more valuable. And that company was Slack. Mm. Right. And I think some uh, one of the other companies that that guy started was a similar story. I think it might have been Flickr. Right. So, you know, there that's are. A, that's an interesting. That's, so that's an interesting premise. So. Would that be saying that there are companies that wound up doing something completely different as they were snowmobiling? They want like yeah. Berkshire Hathaway, you know, uh, was that was a textile mill in I believe Western Massachusetts, and it's not anymore. It's far from that, but it started off as something and continuously evolved into something else. Yeah. Huh. And and the same, you know, I think we mentioned this last in the last episode. Actually, the 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 rise of the commando forces and the special operations executive in world war two mm. right they didn't start with a you know objective kind of outcome they started inventing stuff mm. and they invented so much stuff that they just had all of these capabilities that they could throw together so you know um the invention of the limpet mine was a a snowmobile exercise by a guy who used to build caravans hmm. and you know things like the bouncing one that wasn't the soe but you know snowmobile kind of inventions of capabilities that then found a mission or found a found a um a means of being used rather so, than the other way around so how they found it would that be the answer would the answer be on the next slide that to remain relevant you have to continuously check refine verify your model and you have to constantly update it in order to make sure that it matches up with the reality i think the I, the first i don't know if it was the first iphone or the first ipod but like the first year the first 12 months it went through like three or four different iterations yeah and we say well wait i just bought version one why would i want version three like why would i want version four because like, Apple was constantly improving and building on its model in order to not let it get stale. Yep. So, okay. So. Cause that's the, that's the, that's what he's talking about here because mismatches and inconsistencies are going to continue to rise up. They didn't just cause they made a great snowmobile and it was, it, everybody wanted it. It doesn't mean that it's going to remain relevant mismatches are going to come back up it's 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 not going to function as well as it used to or something else uh is going to is going to step under the scene or something else is going to challenge uh what we're thinking or circumstances are going to change or um you know think about if you were the best carriage maker in the world and then the next thing you know the the car comes out you know henry ford builds the car oh great well that's a mismatch i better get in a car business or else i'm going to yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss out. So you constantly have to, um, again, keep shattering the correspondence because the, because mismatches are going to continue to occur. Just because something was the way it was doesn't mean that you can keep 
you can keep doing it. Yeah, I so love there's, that there's two different there's okay. kind of two different mechanisms here, isn't there? There's the there's the focus of effort turning inwards, which allows you to increase your kind of internal sensory mechanism, right? Your appropriate right. perception if you're a, a, a person or your I don't know, your your you know, the fidelity of your management information if you're a business. So that's one thing, right? You might have no change in the outside world, but your increasing skill of doing something internally gives you the opportunity to identify further things that are mismatching. Mm -hmm. And then there's the far more common one and more often missed one, which is where the, where the external environment changes, but you're wedded to your internal model of the world and you don't update your priors. Yeah, there's one thing that I wanted to pick up here that I, I hadn't noticed before that I'd like your thoughts on. So internal consistency in the yellow box, mm. internal by checking and verifying its internal consistency and reversibility. What What's that reversibility about, do you think? Well, internal consistency, having read this, right, now immediately I start to think of goals and completeness theorem because, again, I mean, mm -hmm. we we've read all the work so we know how this story ends but like i think of that no no system can verify itself from within the system yeah checking it's i have to add the I, um, the reversibility I, i'm not that's not clicking as quickly as the internal consistency yeah what is eventually here this, this doesn't yeah. fit with this doesn't fit with my um my understanding, I don't understand why reversibility is really that required. Hmm. What if it's like back, it's back, back testing or, um, yeah. So that's interesting. I think, I think well, we should, but, but the, second, the second part though, matching up with external reality, oh, totally, makes sense. Yeah. No, totally yeah. makes sense. But so here's, let me have a stab at reversibility then. So there are some, there are some, types of machine learning models mm. where you can get your outputs, but you can't really get an understanding of how those outputs were arrived at. Right. So um, I think probably the same thing happens in the real world um, where, I don't know, there's a great example of, um, I can't remember the book. I think it was in the, it was called the rise of Superman, but it might've been one of, um, <laughs> um, might've been one of Stephen Kotler's books. And it's a story of um, Laird Hamilton doing his big surfing, big wave surfing, and mm. riding one of the, being one of the first people to ride a, a specific wave somewhere. Oh, Chapu. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Or, or Jaws, maybe. I, I, I don't know which one it was. Anyway, one the story in the book is he drops into this wave, and you you know this way more than I do because you're a surfer and I'm, I'm not. Um, I got my Tony Silvani <laughs> sweatshirt on today. Yeah. He drops into this wave and it starts to go horribly wrong mm. and you know if he'd wiped out he would have probably died because it was a huge wave and nobody was surfing those in those days and in that moment of you know whatever what you know peak performance is, is one way of looking at it he did a move that had never been done before mm. so he was in a situation that had never happened before and his intuitive reaction led him to do a move that had never been done before. And it's something like reaching over and grabbing the opposite side of the surfboard for some reason. Don't understand it. Now, that does not gel in neither of those two things, the machine learning model side of things and what Laird Hamilton was able to do in that moment gel with the idea of reversibility for me. So I'm going to have to go away and maybe we could like find somebody who knows Chuck or maybe we could ask... Um, Chet Richards or something, what, what this means. Cause I, you know, we're going pretty deep into this and this is something that's kind of pinging a signal to me that I, I'm not quite getting a full understanding here. No, no. The first part and the second part, or I'm sorry. Yeah. The first and then the, the then the last component, obviously matching up with external reality. I mean, that's really, I'd say it's everything, but that's a massive thing with your orientation, right? If your orientation doesn't, match up now again because we know how the story ends right we know what boyd's snowmobile is ultimately going to be uda because he's going to take entropy uh incompleteness and uncertainty and fuse that together how do we how do we get over that or how do we deal with it yeah um, we know that 
that the, the, incur, the internal consistency of a system can't be proved from within that system. So that's the, mm -hmm. that's the external part. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the reversibility to try to gauge. see. Yeah. I, that, that's the where, the, where I've got the problem. Cause you know, both Heisenberg and, and thermodynamics reversibility is not really mm -mm. like thermo, the, the laws of thermodynamics are the only point in classical physics where the, the, at the arrow of time is part of those equations. So it's in, inherently mm -hmm. non-reversible, right? Some, um, the you know the flow of energy or or, or heat within a system is inherently non-reversible, right? Once mm -hmm. you burn gasoline in an engine, you can't. Yeah, it's gone. You can't. It. You can't unburn it. So, and you know, I think there's a, a similar argument to be made about information and and other parts. So I'm going to definitely have to look into this. I, I don't. I'd actually. I don't actually remember having seen reversibility mentioned in any of Boyd's work or the literature. So I think we're going to have to maybe do well, a bit of checking here. Well, we're showing everybody exactly why we're doing this is to learn it better. I mean, that's the yep. whole, you, and I would tell anybody watching or listening, this is a ongoing continuous process if if you solve all of this or you think you figure all this out you've completely misunderstood what Boyd was saying yeah. i think <laughs> this is to yeah to and this totally was not a plan i um read these slides ages ago yeah didn't spot it then because you know to the to the point at the bottom like the my my ability to make precise observations and concept descriptions wasn't where it was so i didn't pick this up before and you know, this is just the nature of, you know, there's a great phrase that I, I I like to remind myself of, and it's particularly relevant to the topic of these discussions, um, epistemic humility, mm -hmm. right? You don't necessarily know what you think you know. And even, even if you do, the raw material of it might have changed or the situation might have changed or, yeah, you know, all of the combinations of those changes means when, when you come back to the material again, it's somehow different. So this has been good. Like this is the whole point of, of doing, of doing these. Yeah. Well, it's also too, um, oh, I had a thought when you were saying that last, uh, that last bit though well anyway it's not important <laughs> oh i know i was gonna do well we might quote unquote cheat i know that there are some great youtubes that people should watch of chuck actually explaining this document <laughs> yes so. that's, yes that's right yeah okay. and, and he has the slides up too so i'm gonna buffer it through i'm gonna find this slide i'm gonna see what he says okay let's do so. that all right. If, and we I think, I think, if we weren't recording live, I would do it right now. And then we, we just have a cut and pretend like we, <laughs> but no, the learning is the, the learning is the only purpose of doing this. And that's what we're trying to, yeah. to help people uh, understand. And well, this is, I mean, this yeah. has been nice actually, because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good that, you know, it's, but there's, there's different aspects of the raw material that Boyd, grew upon that you and I are both interested in, mm -hmm. um, you know, an overlapping Venn diagram for sure, but not an exact match. So, um, yeah, it's been really interesting that, you know, the, the process of talking through making snowmobiles and we've come up with a, an example of needing to go and do this in, in, in the real world. So I think this is probably a pretty good place to leave it for today. And uh, I'm going to go and do some research. Well, it actually is a good place to stop too, because if you look at the course of the slides, we're going to get into a lot more uh, examples of how this particular, how again, well, spoiler alert, um, ultimately, what are we going to get to? OODA, OODA loop, you know, OODA and OODA loop. Um, and Spinny's going to go through some great examples of different vectors of learning where a scientist said something at, in one age, somebody said something else, and then somebody else took the two of those things and combined it together to create a new understanding of uh, something that didn't previously exist. Yeah, which is exactly what we're going to have to go and do now, now that we've noticed this, uh, this mismatch. Glitch in the, well, 
if it if we're we're living proof of why you continue to reorient. Indeed. I think that that's probably, you know, it's funny. I mean, it's not ironic either. It's it, it's supposed to happen this way. I mean, I think that anyone who tells you that they know everything about something is selling you something. And I got next next time I'm going to find that Boyd quote uh about analysts that Quorum has in the book. Yeah. Um, but it's something like they know a lot about everything, which has absolutely nothing to do with anything. Um, something along those lines. Yeah, well, I mean, we've we've managed to avoid current affairs at the moment, but I think, you know, the the events of the last few days have massively shown that to be true, right? You know, the the whole yeah. pretty much the whole world was saying that, you know, Russia is, you know, a modern military, and there's 150,000 of them. Ukraine's got no chance. They're all over in a day. And then, you know, what's actually happened is the complete, well, we don't know because no, no. we're sat at one end of a social media Ferrari who, you know, which could be accurate or could be not. But from all, from all outside appearances, it seems likely that that has not happened and that actually Ukraine is doing very well on the information war. Um, it seems that they're operating significantly within, you know, Russia's OODA loop, despite Russia mm. having all of the uh, all the advantages. And it's like a perfect example of, you know, to me anyway, it's uh, watching this has been a real, I don't know. I mean, we, we always say that OODA happens whether you know it's know it's happening or not. And I think the events in, in Russia and Ukraine, tra uh, Ukraine, tragic as they are, are an object lesson in why this stuff is so important in so many different domains. The mismatches are palpable. Yeah. And my impression, just being at a large scale event yesterday with everybody looking at their phones, my, my impression is that the mismatches are palpable, but aren't being addressed in terms of challenging any type of narrative, which like, I had a lot of people yesterday because, you know, they know I was in the Marines and they know I studied geopolitics. I know I've worked in capital markets, which, you know, likes to think, you know, you have a pretty good understanding of what, what's going on in the world and what people are paying for what and goods and services, this and that, the other thing. And I tell people flat out, honestly, in this case, <laughs> I'm trying to learn what's going on because there's so many mismatches. Yeah. Um, of course, people would just say, well, that's it. That's ridiculous. X, it's this, that's it, you know, without any uh, yeah. critical or deep thought. I, I almost got sucked into one of those earlier. Actually, it was a, I'll, I'll try and find the, the tweet and put it on a, on the notes here. But um, the tweet was something along the lines of, um, you know, I'm a columnist and um, now. A columnist, like in a newspaper? Oh, yeah, or, yeah. Or like a columnist, a like, like me, no. right? No, so, a reporter, a reporter. Not from, so. not, from, not from somebody from the States. <laughs> no. A columnist, as in a somebody columnist. who writes, writes for a okay. column. Got um, it. And, uh, and now epidemiologist. Um, mm. I've just spent um, a few days going through YouTube so, so I can learn everything I, I need to know about, um, about um, insurgencies. And here's the thread. <laughs> yeah. And of so course, I, the thread was, there's no thread. Don't be an idiot. <laughs> I, I, I saw a meme. I want to say, I, I thought I forwarded it to you, but it, it it showed like a like a baby boomer aged person, like something like my parents' age, they're 70, like in one frame, putting their laptop, like closing their laptop and saying, I'm no longer an expert in epidemiology. And then in the next frame, opening their laptop, I am now an expert on geopolitical, yes, that's exactly geopolitical it. events. <laughs> yeah. And so. I mean, that's the, but that, that just speaks to the whole point of what we're trying to do with this series, right? Is the, the dynamics that we talk about are so fucking important because when they don't happen, you end up, in, in the kind of world that we we have, you know, no epistemic humility. People don't even know what they don't know. They don't right. even know the, the the extent to which they can know things in 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 many many many. And I count myself among that population completely. Yeah, 
so the, uh, I've may have told you about this book a million times, the art of contrary thinking by Humphrey B. Neal. And that's what literally accelerated my, my journey into this. I mean, I had known about OODA loop, you know, I'd been trained it in the Marines and everything. And I was still in the Marine Corps and I was given this book as a recommendation. I bought it. I mean, the underlying premise is that really simple when everyone thinks alike, everyone is likely to be wrong. So, as an example, this place I'm at, there's thousands of people. And the fact that everybody seems to be saying the exact same thing is where I start to pause and really start to ask harder questions to try to understand um, what's going on. And that book is riddled with uh, historical examples. And I was telling another friend that we both know um, earlier that, you know, if you took out in this example, if you change this with that, wouldn't it describe today? And he's like, I'm going to look at it. Whoa. And, you know, and it was written, you know, 70 plus years ago, you know, yeah. and it's the same, it's the same pattern. Um, you know, that might be a, a, a paper that we could collaborate on. It was patterns of conflict. Maybe it's like patterns of, you know, misinformation or patterns of narrative or whatever. Um, because the structure seems to be the same. It's just that the medium pattern disruption, maybe. Yeah. Patterns of disruption, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause it's a narrative like how how do you disconnect from one narrative and ch or challenge a narrative and 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 look at another i think that you have to shatter it right or you have to challenge it although i read i don't know if you've seen this one by gladwell the bomber mafia um it's phenomenal i, I haven't i've kind of gone off gladwell a little bit because i think he suffers from many of the same things that we're talking about but exactly i, I, I would, i'm familiar with what the bomber mafia is though I wouldn't disagree with that assessment. I'll, I'll say that they usually are a pretty good start, though, to mm, do continued yeah. research. Yeah. And the continued sure. research that I did from that book was he was talking about, it's on the other shelf over there, it's called When Prophecy Fails. And I think we talked about it last week or, or earlier about, like, the, remember the, the psychologist that was evaluating the cult in Chicago in the fifties or something. And they said, well, the, the spaceship's coming on new year's Eve. And then, no, no, I was wrong. It's coming 10 days from now. And then it's coming. Yeah. A month from now. But the, the point of it was, is that the people couldn't give up the narrative. Yeah. They couldn't let go of what they were prepared to die for, or, you know, prepared to give everything up. They couldn't let go, even though they readily were shown Beyond a shadow of a reasonable doubt that it was that their model, their uh, their their orientation was completely divergent from reality. They, they didn't care. Yeah. So you know, you just wonder when someone is so convinced. It goes back to the we've used this before in our discussions. Um, it's attributed to either Mark Twain or Will Rogers that when everybody or not not when everybody thinks like when uh, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you're absolutely certain of that turns out not to be true. Yeah. And, um, the big short opens up with that quote. And I, mean, I was in the industry. I saw that firsthand. <laughs> yeah. Literally riding it all the way down to the bottom because even though the reality mismatched from their actions, they couldn't, they couldn't accept it. Yep. Uh, like, that's yep, the well, part there's, there's so much more to dig into. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, these whole shelves down here are all about how we think, you know, because that, that's that's one thing. I guess that's the other reason why Boyd became such a natural interest in uh, for me was that I was always puzzled how people um, would think. You know, when I was a kid, I mean, I told you this story, but yeah, I grew up in West Germany. Uh, my father was assigned and we lived in Bavaria. And if you've been to Bavaria, I mean, it's, you know, pastoral and beautiful and old ancient cities like fairy tale castles and this and that. And I remember my mother saying, I just don't understand how these, how like Nazism could have uh, evolved here through Munich and Nuremberg. I mean, it just doesn't seem like the place, you know, and um, like you wonder where people it's just like, how do people think these things? How do people that their culture seems so inconsistent with something that was so evil and diver and divergent from reality and did such terrible things? You know, how how would seemingly, you know, kind, friendly people go along with it, you know, or whatever? 
But yeah. that's when that that's that's where I, I don't know. I think of that when I take an interest in like mass psychology. Like how do we mm. how do we think of things? How do narratives get crafted? And you know, do we challenge them or or don't we challenge them? Um, I have a you know I'm an economist, and one of the areas of economics I was always very interested in is like behavioral economics. Why do people do certain things? And you know confirmation bias or uh bandwagon effect like when everybody's doing something i don't want to be the guy to challenge it i don't want to be the one to say uh i was different than everybody else or everybody else is going along with it then i better go along with it too because i don't want to be yeah. left out or i don't want to be well i mean that's the that's the amazing thing about boyd's work isn't it is that it just how well it not explains but how well it fits with all of the research that has gone on in the sort of 20 years, 25 years, nearly. Yeah. 25 years. And he did 25 not have, years this year, isn't it? Yeah. In March. He did. He did not have a problem with being the lone person to think a certain way or to say a certain thing. Yeah. He, it's he, ironic, he, isn't it today that many, many of the people that are claiming to do their own research or are claiming to be, contrarian thinkers are just you know part of a group thing that's a different shape you know there's still well, imagine if you were in bavaria in those days you know not to pick on the germans but just imagine like you were the one that said well wait this is wrong what would yeah. happen <laughs> you know i don't want to wind up like them what happened well they shipped them out of here I, you know that's yeah. scary you know and you want to yeah. be able to you want to be able to say or, you know, if you observe, again, that's what you know, we talked before about like a observer status versus participant status. If you're participating, you're defining something in terms of what you're participating in. You're, if you're not asking the questions and stopping and giving pause to something, you know, you could be going along with, you know, the wrong, yeah. uh, the wrong direction. That's yeah. the that's the dialectic aspect of what we're talking about. You know, the uh, take the antis you know, you have the th you hear the thesis. What's the anti antithesis or the antithesis? You know, yep. it, it, not just to be a contrarian for contrarian sake, be a contrarian to work your way back to see. Um, I'm trying to think of what brief it was in. It wasn't patterns of conflict. Was it strategic game of question mark and question mark? Um, it was talking about how. Um, something about taking the opposite view and working. It's in the it's in the PDF, the compendium of all the briefs. The 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 one from uh, the yeah, airport. it doesn't it doesn't ring a bell offhand. Yeah, but it's saying something along the lines of 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 taking the opposite view and working your way back. Not that see that's the other thing too. That and that's in the the book, the art of contrary thinking. The popular view might not be wrong. Yeah. That doesn't mean it should go unchallenged though. Yeah. That's the, that's, that's, I mean, that's, I think totally that's the it. point. Yeah, you know, totally. It. All so, right. Well, look, let's uh, let's uh, knock it on the head there, and um, we'll go and do our research, and we'll come back with the art. Well, an answer, many answers, maybe, and um, and then move on to to three of n. <laughs> yeah, three of n. <laughs> Still no idea what n is. Now that's the cool part about it. So. Yeah. All right. Great stuff. I'll uh, I'll stop the end the live stream there. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, yep. 